Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm Kevin Navratil, and I'm a political science professor and the Democracy Commitment Coordinator. And I'm happy to be moderating this panel discussion today titled Inequality, Automation, Algorithms, and Technology, a faculty panel. And this is part of our One Book, One College event. Um, this year's book is Isaac Asimov's uh, iRobot. And the idea is that we pick out themes from the book and discuss them in events like we have today. Um, I want to point out that everybody is sitting in a chair that had one of these evaluations uh, that are in green. And if at the end of today's event, if you could fill this out for us, it would be very helpful to get your feedback. Um, there's um, an area to put them in behind the little tree over here um, off to the side. So I'm very happy to be the, the moderator of this discussion today. It's an interesting discussion that I think Isaac Asimov would be very happy to know that 70 years later we're still grappling with the implications of technology and what they have on society. And I'm very happy to be joined by this great uh, faculty panel today. Um, to my far right, we have uh, Brian Kurth. He's a mathematics professor. And directly next to me, we have Tish Hayes, who's a information literacy uh, librarian. And to my left, we have Dr. Amy Williamson, who is a psychology professor. And on my far left, we have uh, Jeffrey McCauley, Dr. Jeffrey McCauley, who is a sociology professor. So. To start us off, I'm going to uh, ask each of our panel members a question, and then um, we're going to let give some time to them to answer that, and then hopefully have about 20 minutes towards the end for any questions and comments that the audience may have. So to start us off, uh, Brian, could you tell us uh, what an algorithm is and how they might be applied to our lives? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Now before I do that, I would like to address indirectly what an algorithm is by saying what it is not. An algorithm is not, despite the phonetic pronunciation of it, it is not an algorithm. <laughs> it's actually something very scientific uh, and useful all over the place. Lots of ways you can define it. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I prefer to think of it most simply as just a set of instructions. Now, sometimes that's in computer code, sometimes that's in mathematics, sometimes it's just in pictures. Lots of ways you can present a set of instructions, a lot of things you can do with them, many ways you can interpret them. Let's see here. There we go. So some ways we apply algorithms in everyday life. Cooking. Cooking recipes. Take a half a tablespoon of this, a cup of this, do this with it. Bake it for so long at such and such a temperature and poof, you should have something. Although when I follow cooking recipes, it doesn't always come out quite right, although that's probably operator error on my end. Assembly directions. You buy some furniture from Ikea and it comes with these pictures that we have to interpret uh, as to how to build uh, our furniture. Cake splitting. This was an algorithm I used as a child and I didn't know I was using an algorithm. This was just what we did in our family. If you want to split a piece of cake with your sibling, one person cuts, the other person chooses and that maximizes the probability that nobody is unsatisfied with their size of their cake. Driving directions, we use maps and ways and Google Maps and all sorts of programs that use algorithms to give us algorithms how to get to where we want to go. And as I'm sure m many of us know, uh, they're not always infallible, uh, but they're better than nothing in many cases. Rubik's Cube, and the old pastime, is a series of algorithms. Many algorithms are out there. You can YouTube them, you can do research, you can take entire classes. Uh, on the mathematics uh, behind and related to the <coughs> Rubik's Cube. There are many examples that are just pure mathematics. I'm sure everybody remembers long division uh, from grade school, or perhaps in algebra completing the square, or reducing a matrix, solving equations, uh, many, many more. If you search for algorithms, you will find a great, great number of them. Let's see, uh, online shopping. If, say, on Amazon you buy a copy of Isaac Asimov's iRobot, it may say, oh, since you purchased iRobot by Isaac Asimov, you might enjoy Foundation by Isaac Asimov, which is a great book, by the way. Streaming media, since you watched such and such, you might enjoy watching such and such a program or a movie. Social media and news, this is a big one. Since you read or liked 
this article, you might like this news article, uh, real or fake or otherwise. <laughs> uh, credit scores, uh, this number that banks use and potential employers use. I understand the actual workings of it are hidden uh, behind closed doors and they're tight-lipped about it, but who knows? You know, why is somebody allowed to calculate a number about me in a mysterious way and then use it for their own purposes? Hiring algorithms, some hiring algorithms, I understand, do look at your credit scores. Presumably it's based on the assumption, true or false, that if you have a high credit score, you're going to be a good employee, which uh, we can debate about that. Medicine. They can use algorithms to process medical information at a very quick pace, make predictions, say, well, these genes are likely to mutate, or this is likely to happen, or cancer is likely to happen, having scanned all these uh, bits of medical data, doing this faster than any human could. Military uses, for better or for worse. Uh, they have ideas like battle space awareness, force application, protection, logistics, all sorts of things. So at this point, I will uh, turn it over to my colleagues um, yeah. to discuss. I was going to ask Tish uh, how technology and algorithms might impact the way that we encounter information. Sure. And thank you, Brian, for kind of breaking down what an algorithm is. Because I think we, most of us, go through our day-to-day -day not really thinking about the way algorithms impact the way we engage with the world. Um, and I think that's especially true when we think about the way we use Google. So we often are going to Google doing a search and expecting to get back pretty useful, relevant information. And I think we just, if we do think about algorithms, we think about them in the ways they make our lives more useful. Again, the example of like going to Google, getting the info we need. Um, what we don't always think about is the way algorithms in search um, engines like Google or library databases or social media might be reflecting the biases of the humans who created those algorithms. Those are algorithms that are human-made, typically. Um, they're also bringing back information sources that were created by humans. And um, often, the combination of those things reveal biases within society. Um, Sophia Umoja Noble, who is an associate professor at UCLA and a visiting faculty member to the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communication, has written this amazing book called Algorithms of Oppression, uh, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. And she has done a lot of thinking and a lot of research on the way commercial interests of search engines and the lack of representation of marginalized groups in the tech sector contribute to algorithms that reinforce racism. Um, and her work has transformed the way I think about the way I teach information. So I may have had sessions with you, I may in the future, where we talk about how to you know, optimize search strategies and keywords to bring back really useful information. Well, we can do all of that, but what if the actual foundation of what we're searching is problematic? Um, how do we think about that in our search strategies? So I wanted to present some of her research, and I think maybe the best way to do that is to let her talk for herself. So I have a really short three-minute video um, where she presents some of what she found and what is presented within this fantastic book. Okay. Let me play that for you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Safia Umoja Noble, and I'm an assistant professor in the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. My research looks at racist and sexist algorithmic bias and the way in which people are marginalized and oppressed by digital media platforms. I spent 15 years in corporate marketing and advertising, working for some of the largest Fortune 100 brands in the United States. We were starting to redirect significant portions of our advertising media buying dollars online and thinking about, in fact, how to game Google Search and Yahoo to elevate the brands and amplify the messages. And so at the moment that I was leaving corporate America and moving into academia, the public was increasingly falling in love with Google. And this led me to thinking that this was a space and a place that needed to be looked at more closely. It was interesting to see this total diversion of public goods, um, public knowledge in libraries being shifted into a corporate, privately held company. When we go to places like Google Search, 
The public generally thinks that what they'll find there will be credible and fairly representing different kinds of ideas, people, and spheres of knowledge. And so this is what really prompted a six-year inquiry into this phenomenon of thinking about misrepresentation on the internet, particularly when people are using search engines. And that culminated in my new book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. People think of algorithms as simply a mathematical formulation. But in fact, algorithms are really about automated decisions. In 2009, I was kind of joking around, in fact, with a colleague, and I was telling him that I was really interested in what's happening with Google. And just kind of offhand, he said to me, oh yeah, you should see what happens when you Google black girls. Of course, I immediately did the search, found that pornography was the primary way that black girls, Latina girls, Asian girls were represented. That started a whole deeper line of inquiry about the way in which misrepresentation happens for women of color on the internet and what some of the broader social consequences of that are. But in my work, I look at the way that these platforms are designed to amplify certain voices and silence other voices. How does that come about? What is that phenomenon about? What's the role of capital or advertising dollars in driving certain results to the first page? What do the results mean in kind of a broader social, historical, economic context? So I contextualize the results that I find to show how incredibly problematic this is because it further marginalizes people who are already living in the margin, people who are already suffering from systemic oppression. And yet again, these results show up in these platforms as if they are credible, fair, objective, neutral ideas. In the end, I call for alternatives. And I argue um, strongly that we need to have uh, things like public interest search that are not driven by commercial biases. And I put out some ideas about um, what it means to imagine and create alternatives uh, in our public information sphere that are based on a different set of ethics. If anything, I think that this book is the kind of book that will help us reframe the idea that we should just Google it and everything will be fine. Thanks for letting me share that with you. Um, as a librarian and as someone who, as I mentioned, spends a lot of time thinking about the way we engage with information, the way we search for information, her book was transformative for me. It made me think about the advice that I give you in classes. It made me think about the ways I search for information. And so when we're looking for information, whether it's for our personal use or research for a class, what we find often shapes our understanding of that topic, right? And many, for myself and for you maybe, we often go looking for information when we don't know about something yet. We're looking for information about it. And so if we are finding information, even if we're using like really relevant keywords, evaluating those results, we often don't have the context for understanding the information that Google might be providing to us. And so we need bigger, a, a better way to understand that context. Often that's through a class, through conversation with people who may know more than we do about that information. Uh, one of the most powerful chapters in per, uh, Noble's book, and one that I continue to think about and helps inform the way I talk about information and information seeking, is uh, she describes the process by which Dylan Roof, who is the white supremacist who shot up an African American church in um, South Carolina, um, how he began this process of like kind of fueling his hate through the research um, that he was doing on black and white crime. And so she, Noble talks about um, that what didn't show up prioritized in his search results were crime statistics that reveal the most that most violent crime is intraracially per perpetrated or that the exaggerations of black on white crime have a long history as part of a racist and anti-black black narrative. And she uses that example to highlight the real world consequences for folks that are marginalized um, because of a commercial search engine that prioritizes popularity and revenue over accuracy and knowledge. So she talks about that in the video too, right? That we take all of these public goods and when we make them bound by popularity and commercialism, the results aren't great for marginalized folks. 
So she goes on to articulate some of the dangers of search engines in that they oversimplify complex phenomena, they obscure any struggle over understanding, and they can mask history. Search engine results can reframe our thinking and deny us the ability to engage deeply with essential information and knowledge we need, knowledge that has traditionally been learned through teachers, books, history, and experience. Again, the context that you get in a classroom is really different than the information that you're getting from just Googling something. And so the internet, although it's popularly <coughs> framed as a democratizing force, and it can be um, providing access to information without interference or oversight of gatekeepers, Noble helps us see that there is a gatekeeper, that the gatekeepers are typically the people who are programming the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So these biases and algorithms aren't a new phenomenon. An example from um, an essay, Racist in the Machine, The Disturbing Implications of Algorithmic Bias, details a computer program in the 70s and 80s designed to screen applicants for medical school in the UK. The algorithm learned from the decisions made by staff in the past and replicated those choices. So in the 70s and 80s, women and people with non-European sounding names were not getting called in for interviews. So when machines learn from bad or biased data, they magnify human prejudice. So um, again, coming back to the ways we engage with information, whether it's through a Google search or our social media feeds, we need to be aware that the presentation of that information has been optimized for commercial interests. And those algorithms that are typically being programmed um, are being programmed by people who are the least marginalized and the most privileged. So what do we do when we encounter information in this way? We still need really good search strategies. We need good keywords and we need evaluation techniques. So hopefully the things that we do in a library classroom are very relevant still. Um, but we also need to look for context when looking, for the, when looking at those results, whether it's from a library database or Google. Um, and then institutionally, we need to make changes. So we need more people of color and women in technology fields. We need better data sets that are not biased in the first place. Um, we need to ask for more transparency around the way search engines and social media rank and present data. And a number of researchers and thinkers, including Noble, talk about using or creating systems that aren't based on commercial platforms. What does it look like if we had a social media platform that didn't prioritize ads? That might be revolutionary. Um, so I'm going to skip these. We have a lot of information in the library um, that talks about all of these different contexts and all of this different kind of information and how algorithms work. So if you want to follow up, um, talk to me after this session. Thank you, Tish. Um, next, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Williamson uh, to tell us just a little bit about how psychology might help us better understand the implications of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, I don't think so. Do you want to use mine? No, hello? Yeah, there we go. There okay, we go. thank you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I, I want to say that um, a lot of money is being thrown at replicating the brain. Microsoft is putting a billion dollars into um, OpenAI, which is trying to develop some kind of artificial intelligence that would come close to replicating how the brain processes information. And the global spending is predicted to be about $57 billion. So there's a lot of people trying to figure out you know, how can we create this intelligence that's going to uh, either mimic the human brain or maybe surpass it? Part of the issue now, um, or one of the issues is that uh, we will never be able to compute, calculate as fast as a computer can. Um, the brain has neurons that only travel at about one third of the speed of sound, which is relatively quickly, but it's slow in comparison to what a computer can do, which can travel at the speed of light. So we uh, are at a little bit of a disadvantage there. Um, so just to kind of break this down a little bit, um, th there's three kinds of, of learning uh, from the computer perspective. And uh, s they replicate human decision making a little bit differently. So the first one is artificial intelligence, which we've probably all heard of. Um, and it imitates human decision making by sifting through large amounts of information and then kind of telling us what to do or not do um, based on algorithms. So things like, um, you know, uh, the GPS and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
what's going to happen is that um, w we're going to try to move deeper into this um, learning and imitating uh, how humans learn and how humans make decisions. Um, machine learning would be the next layer. And um, that's where people are now empowering computers with the ability to learn on their own. So we give them vast amounts of data and algorithms and then the computers kind of figure things out by trial and error. Um, these are, you've probably seen um, like that chess tournament where the chess machine beats every, I don't know if you've seen it, like nobody can beat that chess machine or things like that. Um, that's machine learning. So it's still kind of uh, uh, basic. Um, when you get to deep learning, um, the deep learning is when they would fully replicate what the brain is capable of doing by layering um, kind of these neuronal um, networks. And eventually um, the machine would be able to learn on its own without being programmed. Okay, so without having all this data. I don't, you know, neuroscience says it's a hundred years out. Computer science. It's, we turned it off again. Okay, sorry. I don't know. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Um, neuroscience says it's a hundred years out. Computer science says it's like 10 to 20 years out. So who knows, right? We don't, we're not sure what, what's going to happen with that. Um, part of the issue is that, you know, our, our, our brains uh, are still not fully understood. We don't fully understand a lot of things about consciousness, for instance, and what does that look like and what does that mean? Okay, a good example here. Um, so what do you see up there? Anybody want to tell me what they see? Yeah, what do you see? Oh, you see both. Okay. Uh, anybody see something right away? One thing? Yeah. You saw the duck. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people see the duck. Okay, some people see the rabbit, but most people see the duck. So this is really just an ambiguous um, stimuli that we might see, and we decode it. Our brain decodes it and then makes an assumption and says, okay, this is what it is. Um, AI uh, has a little bit of difficulty with this. So we experience the world and we build a map of the world through our senses. So what we see, what we hear, what we touch, what we taste, what we feel, those things. Um, AI is not capable of that yet. They're trying to replicate uh, some pieces of it with um, the ability to understand sound. So there's now programming that can understand, you probably have used Shazam, Shazam before, where you can like hold it up and then tell you what song you're hearing. Um, not only that, but it would be able to tell you like what genre of music it is and, and kind of detect you know, wh where it fits into this, uh, th this continuum of, of musical, you know, variety, I guess. So those things um, are, are close to what we can do, but not quite at the level that we can do it. Um, we, uh, neural networks don't see the same, even though they're, uh, you know, trying to create them the way the brain would work, they don't see the same as we do. They're still based on this algorithm where there's these yes, you no know, decisions that are constantly being made millions and millions of times very quickly. Um, so uh, right now, uh, the biggest problem with AI is it's called a binding problem. So their ability, the ability for computers and, and uh, artificial intelligence to bind things together. They, they'll see pieces, so they might see this as a duck, but the ability to then tr shift back and forth, oh, rabbit duck, rabbit duck, would be uh, difficult for them. Um, so this kind of brings up the um, bias that we have as humans, and Tish talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, everybody has different sensory experiences. We all learn differently, and so who is AI going to be modeled after, right? Whose perspective is it taking? Um, who's doing the programming? What are, what's the cultural lens that you view it through? We all have kind of, you know, different ways that we perceive the world, and then that is the lens that we hold up when we go out into the world and we see through that, right, and, and, and experience the world through that. And so what is that going to look like for uh, artificial intelligence? You know, how will they be perceiving things? Um, there's right now a big field in psychology called behavioral engineers. Um, and these are people who um, engineer people's behavior. And basically they work for large companies and their job is to predict the needs of people before they know it, that before they know what they need. 
So well, things like Netflix predicting what you might want to watch or Amazon predicting what you might want to buy or what you might want to eat. Um, this is interesting because what we know about humans is that we have kind of two tracks in our brain. We have the rational track and then we have the, or the rational, let's say, conscious track and then the subconscious track, right? And most of our decisions are really made through that subconscious track. The rational, you know, mind plays a role, but AI is really based on that one track rather than kind of looking at this intuitive side. So you get gut feelings about things, you, you might not even know why you chose something, right? Your, your brain has to, after the fact, de facto come up with this explanation for why you decided this was a good thing to do or not do. Um, so even though our rational brain thinks it's the CEO, it's really more of, um, you know, the press that kind of puts together what, the it, you know, why did I do something after the fact? And we really don't have a good way to uh, figure out how that's going to play out with AI because we Building that in right now, um, again, seems like it's a long, long, far off event, but uh, who knows? You know, I, I, my specialty is not computer science, so I don't know how quickly that's going to happen. Um. No, 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 I thought your microphone. No, no, no. I th okay. That's another question yeah. for you. Is it, is it, is it, is it off? Is that one question? Yeah. That okay. All right. So, just to, I've p prepared way too much information <laughs> here to talk to you guys about. I, I think the other thing in terms of us AI changing us um, is that one of the big, um, I'm just going to jump ahead to this quote, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. And technology and AI is, is that, right? It's this huge thing. And so the question is, what's going to come with that? What are we going to be dealing with? Um, one of the big things is that right now people tend to feel fragmented, they tend to feel exhausted, there's this cost of effectiveness that happens with technology, and um, you know, we're still grappling with that. It's happening so fast, we really haven't had time to grapple with a lot of these issues. Um, there's rapid, dramatic change in communication. There's, um, you know, how do you communicate with each other now? What kinds of um, conversations do you have? Um, you know, do we trust technology more than we trust other people? Uh, there was a study in Vancouver uh, with a virtual therapist, and the people actually disclosed two times more personal information to the virtual therapist than they did to the person. Uh, that, that's kind of interesting and kind of scary um, that we would trust technology more. You know, I mean, anytime you look at your phone, you know, you have all their different apps and you have all these different information coming at you. Most of us just trust what it says and believe it, right? I, you know, your GPS might say, turn left. You think, well, I always turn right, but the GPS told me to turn left, so there I go. <laughs> you know, and you follow the instructions of technology really without a lot of critical thinking about it because it's easy and that's what our brains are wired to do. Um, the confirmation bias piece is probably one of the biggest issues that will come up, and I think Tish alluded to that, which was basically that we begin to have these echo chambers because um, confirmation bias is when we seek out information that we already believe to be true. So we're, we're going out into the world and we're confirming what we already believe, and technology allows us to do even more of that, um, and that's that's an issue. I, I don't know how, how many of you are wearing earbuds, okay, the little white buds everybody's wearing now. Um, but that is, that's also kind of keeping people in this echo chamber, this, this loop of your own design, right, where you're not really, you're, you're interacting with the world to some degree, but you're interacting with your own stuff all the time. And as that becomes more and more common, you know, what is that going to look like for us um, as humanity? Um, Privacy, you know, what do we want people to know? There's billions of bits of data about ourselves floating around out there that, that companies are capturing. And, you know, who has access to that data? Um, right now it's a monopoly by very few large companies. And, and so they're using that information to manipulate our behavior, control our behavior, to have us do things that, of course, you know, spend money that they want us to spend and so on. What? Say it again. Facebook, uh, any, yeah, any of those, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you're, uh, even just having your phone in front of you, you know, all of those things are uh, collecting bits of data every time you touch it, every time it pings, you know, 
you know, what is that, right? We're classically conditioned to respond to those things. And so it, it's changing us as humans. And what is it going to look like when we're relating to, you know, non-human intelligence, really? That's what we're talking about is what does non-human intelligence look like and how are we going to relate to that and how are we going to deal with it? And it's coming up really quickly. Um, and and I, I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information on who's regulating this. You know, it's just kind of wild, wild west out there. We're just going to figure it all out after the fact. And that can be really dangerous. Um, I... I think that the, uh, one of the things that I thought was probably the scariest, I'm just going to jump here. Here's your pings and your bings that get you, you know, get you to react. Um, yeah, here, here's therapy will be, <laughs> will be uh, kind of reduced to, you know, we'll be texting each other instead of actually talking to each other. Um, but this, this data, it's, it's not going to make sense. Right? I'm just going to kind of break it down. So there's something called predictive policing. Has anybody heard of that? Predictive policing, okay. So basically, um, it's a new technology based on algorithms where um, you know, we're gonna now predict where is the crime gonna occur? Who's gonna be the one committing the crime? And when you look at this data, what you'll see is that the algorithm was twice as likely to label black defenders as high risk who did not reoffend. The algorithm is wrong but we're trusting these things to make these decisions and to do these kinds of activities for us. Um, and it's gonna create a lot of social issues, right, if we don't get a handle on it. So not to be like s scary about it, but I think that there's a lot of things that we can start looking at to help to, to manage some of these issues. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Williamson. And now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. McCauley and he's gonna talk about some of the winners and losers with uh, technology and algorithms, how it might perpetuate social inequities. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so do technology and algorithms perpetuate social inequalities? It's true that they perpetuate inequalities, but in order to understand how that happens, we have to start with thinking about where technology or science or algorithms come from. So sorry if this is a little bit of repeat about what Tish talked about, but um, I always think if you hear things a couple times, that's when you learn it, so, <laughs> so let's try that. Um, so science and technology and algorithms uh, come from knowledge, and knowledge is situated. So let's start there. Uh, there's a phenomenal author called Donna Haraway, and uh, I just want to talk a little bit about her work called Situated Knowledges. There's page one of her article that I want to talk about. So we like to think about knowledge as objective, as though knowledge or facts are just true everywhere for everyone, as though if you open your eyes, you will see this vision, and the truth will be there. Um, it will be there objectively for everyone to see. However, Donna Haraway reminds us that knowledge comes from a perspective. The vision or types of knowledge that are uh, given the most credit in society often come from white and male eyes. These white and male eyes, this white and male vision, uh, are often coming from what Haraway refers to as, quote, scientific and technological late industrial militarized racist and male dominant societies. That is, here in the belly of the monster, the United States. So what does that mean? It means that knowledge doesn't exist on its own. There is no such thing as value-free knowledge. Knowledge always comes from a viewpoint. Knowledge comes from a specific context. What it means in that context can differ uh, from what it means in some other specific context. Knowledge emerges from a specific social, cultural, historical context, and the context dictates what knowledge can emerge. In other words, knowledge is situated. Social stratification influences the types of knowledges that are produced and perpetuated. Social stratification just means social inequalities. So the social stratification of a society dictates whose knowledge comes to the fore, whose knowledge is seen as worthwhile, and whose knowledge is sought after. When we apply this to technology, we can think about whose knowledge is used in the creation of mainstream technology. To think about how technology perpetuates social inequalities, I have a couple examples I want to focus on, and they are photography and, since our book is iRobot, uh, robots. So technology, or uh, excuse me, photography and uh, robots. So I want to spend a second just talking about uh, color photography. Color photography was developed uh, by white people with white people's skin tones in mind. For a long time, Kodak was the only name in the game for developing photography, a uh, color photography. 
Uh, when you wanted to develop the film, uh, there was a whole big process that had to happen. The brightness and hues and saturation all needed to be adjusted every time. So you know how when you go, if you post an Instagram and you can edit all your things and move the thing this way and that way and change all the different uh, pictures that you want to post, that had to be done for every single image on every single roll of color film uh, to produce the color pictures when color photography first came around in like the 1950s. So to make sure that that all of that hues and saturation and color, to make sure that everything was done correctly, um, Kodak created this machine that they would give to companies that develop photography. And with that machine would come something called a Shirley card. So the Shirley card was, to ma was used to match up skin tones white skin tones. So basically, you'd have the picture that you're developing in front of you, and you'd have the Shirley card, and that's the actual Shirley card, and you'd have the Shirley card in front of you, and you would just tweak and adjust everything in terms of the saturation and color and brightness and all that sort of stuff until the skin tones matched. And once the skin tones matched, it was assumed then that everything else in the picture would match. The consequence of this, the result of this, is that, of course, anybody who wasn't white doesn't show up very well in pictures. Uh, so this is still a problem today. If we have, uh, let's say, a couple's getting their engagement photos taken or something like that, and one person has a really light complected skin tone and another person has a darker complected skin tone, sometimes the person with the darker complected skin tone is maybe even invisible in the picture. So maybe you've seen something like this. Um, and it's especially true, like I said, if you're taking pictures of multiple people with various skin tones. As a result of that, there's all sorts of advice and how-to guides um, for how to combat this problem. So this is just, I just typed into Google how to take pictures of dark skin tones, and there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of results. And YouTube videos, I clicked on one of them, you can see it's purple. Uh, so those are just a couple of snapshots of the, uh, snapshots of the pages that I found. Um, but of course, if you try to Google how do I take pictures of white skin tones, there aren't any search results for that, because of course the technology was created with white skin tones in mind. So not only are people of color underrepresented in photography, a whole bunch of extra work is required to even represent them if they are portrayed in photography. Eventually, Kodak did decide to start making um, more Shirley cards with different representations of skin tones in them, but it wasn't because people of color were complaining. Of course, people were complaining, hey, we can't, like, why can't I show up in this picture? So people were complaining, but that wasn't the reason that Kodak decided to make this change. Kodak made the change because they were receiving a lot of complaints from companies, specifically companies that made furniture and companies that made chocolate, because when they tried to advertise for their products, which were brown products, uh, the products didn't show up very well in the marketing materials that they created, and you couldn't see the chocolate, or you couldn't see the furniture. So it wasn't, e so, so color photography didn't advance to portray people of various skin tones. It was portrayed to uh, make sure that companies could continue to sell their products. So we eventually do get uh, Shirley cards that have a variety of skin tones in them. But like I said, it was only after uh, companies did it at the request to make more money. So this might seem trivial, maybe it doesn't seem trivial, I don't know. Um, it seems however it seems to you. Uh, but it does have actual real life and death consequences. So spoiler, people can actually die from this. So I'll get to that if you're wondering how the, hell how the heck that can happen, sorry. Uh, we'll get to that when I look at robots. So let's switch over to robots then. Uh, so I want to think about robots in two different ways, um, whether or not people, or whether or not robots are racist, yes, robots can be racist, and whether or not people can be racist towards robots, yes, people can be racist towards robots. So let's start with um, whether or not robots are racist, yes, 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 robots are racist. So the example I'd like to share ties right back into uh, this idea of photography. So can I just see a show of hands? And you, d you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'll answer the question for myself. Can I see a show of hands for anybody who would be interested in getting a self-driving car? Anybody? I would personally love to have a self-driving car. I would love it. I live kind of far away, so my commute would be wonderful. I could sit back, I could read a book, I could chat on the phone with my grandma and not pay attention. It would be wonderful, all right? Self-driving car sounds great to me. Um, but it turns out that due to how we've created cameras, it's harder to see darker skin tones. So research shows that self-driving cars are less likely to notice black pedestrians compared to white pedestrians. They're less likely to see black people, thus they're less likely to stop for black people, and thus they're more likely to hit black people. So somebody could actually die because of the way that we've developed um, color photography and the technology that's used with white skin tones in mind. 
So that's just one example of how robots can be racist. Uh, there's a ton of other examples, but we're limited on time. I was reading an article about robots that are being used in beauty pageants and all the sorts of interesting things that happen if you have a robot um, being the judge of a beauty pageant. So yeah, pe uh, robots can be racist, but people can be racist against robots too. Um, so I want to just uh, preface this with a little bit of backstory about a, a, a strand of research called shooter bias studies. So this again ties in with what Dr. Williamson was talking about with policing. Um, so in shooter bias studies, people are asked to make a split second decision uh, as though they were the police. So they're shown a quick succession of images and sometimes a person is holding a gun, sometimes a person is not holding a gun. If the person's holding the gun, they got to hit the shoot button. If the person's not hitting the gun, they say like they don't shoot. All right. Uh, and from these shooter bias studies, we can see it's very clear that uh, people are more likely to hit the shoot button if it's a black person in the picture, uh, speci more specifically if it's a black male person in the picture, um, regardless as to whether or not they're actually holding a gun in the picture. Um, so to me, as a sociologist, that's not too surprising, but maybe that's surprising to you. So researchers have then uh, taken that same sort of I idea. Oh, I forgot to show you my picture of the self-driving car. Um, there's a self-driving car, if you like pictures of self-driving cars. All right, uh, so, we c so researchers have also taken this idea of shooter bias studies and applied them to robots. So there's the study about um, shooting, uh, excuse me, the, the black pedestrians. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting to show my pictures from my slides. I'm getting carried away in the conversation. So, so the idea about uh, the shooter bias studies, we could see the same thing happening if we see a white robot or a black robot, so or a brown robot. So I have some robots here, and um, some of them are holding uh, like a drink, and some of them are holding a gun. Maybe you could imagine a black or a white robot holding a bag of Skittles. Uh, the same research is shown to be true that when a person, regardless of that person, uh, regardless of what the person, the regardless of what the robot is actually holding, the person in the study is more likely to hit shoot when it's the dark complected robot um, versus whether or not it is the light complected robot. So it's interesting that we can ha develop perceptions about robots depending on what color the skin of the robot is, if it's a, a white robot or a black robot or whatever the case may be. So it's interesting that this racial bias against people also applies to robots, which are not people. So there's lots of issues to explore uh, with, like I said, the robots being used as beauty pageants. Another issue to explore, uh, which we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about a lot of issues, but is the automation of jobs and how a lot of jobs that are being replaced by technology are often jobs that are occupied by people who are of lower socioeconomic status and who are maybe racial and ethnic minorities, especially if we're thinking about who is likely to be taxi drivers or bus drivers. Or So if, we're if we have these self-driving cars, then we're replacing a labor force of people who are already in many ways disenfranchised from the economy. So there's lots of issues to explore here, um, but what we can think about is how uh, it's all based in technology that is created from a certain viewpoint. Our cultural values dictate what technology is created, for whom it is created, who gets to use it, and who it's used against. So in other words, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists as part of our cultural context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we thought we'd turn it to, to the audience, see if there was questions and comments uh, that you might have for any of the panel members. And I have a microphone. Oh, you didn't know you were getting the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. In the shooter instance, were they required to hit shoot, or were did they have the option to say, I don't want to shoot any of them? Yeah, there's a shoot and a don't shoot button. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Like, why are there so, uh, like, few people concerned about the actual development of, like, AI? And, like, why are more people more geared towards going further with it than stopping and actually saying, like, what are we doing? One, one answer that I, is, is that um, there's so few people and companies that are in control of what's happening right now. Um, and, and there's just very little regulation in general of them, you know, of Facebook and um, uh, Amazon and, and those huge conglomerate corporations. Um, there's no regulation there. And so 
why not do whatever we can with it? We don't. We can do whatever we want, um, and and then we'll figure it out after the fact. Part of the issue, I think, there is that they're not as likely to be affected, <laughs> impacted by some of these things that that we've been talking about, right? Because they're kind of in control of all this. So, um, yeah, that would be my thought. I'm reminded from a line from Jurassic Park where Jeff Goldblum says. Uh, sometimes scientists are so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they did not stop to think if they should. Maybe that answers it, maybe not. Um, a lot of the research that I've done, the people that are doing work that pushes against AI are people who are not necessarily like the majority in those fields. So women, people of color, they're the ones doing the research. And they're doing amazing research. I'm following a lot of um, scientists on Twitter that like are just super inspiring. but most of the people doing the research, doing the technology, like they are the people who are benefiting from all of this. And so I think it's, again, going back to um, Professor Noble's talk, like really we have to shift the focus to like who is doing the research and, and making sure that women and people of color are part of those conversations and the ones who are you know leading the research instead of basically white men who are benefiting from all of these uh, advances. So you kind of mentioned um, the fact that individuals are more likely uh, to press shoot when kind of faced with that darker robot. Why is it that you know individuals feel more uh, pressed to, to, to press shoot uh, with the more darker robots? I think there's a number of answers to that question. I think you could uh, use psychology to answer that question. You could use sociology to answer that question and political science and lots of different fields. Uh, so from a sociological perspective, I would think that um, part of the reason why people will be more primed to press the shoot button if it's uh, a black person, regardless of whether or not that person is holding a gun, or a black robot, regardless of whether or not that robot is holding a gun, is because how we think of uh, people and their portrayals in mass media. If we're constantly being bombarded with messages and news stories and uh, you know, nighttime cop drama shows and so on that are disproportionately exaggerating the amount of crime committed by and against uh, African American people, then people start to internalize that message that that's, you know, how the world is. And I think, I think that would be a major contribu a contributing factor to it is the mass media that we consume. But I imagine there's probably something in terms of psychology. I'm not sure if anybody else wants to talk about this, but... Yeah, I'll just mention um, the idea of implicit bias. Remember the two brain systems that I mentioned? There's this conscious brain system that's uh, going, but there's an unconscious brain system. So a lot of what we do comes from that side of the brain. And, and I say side, meaning just that part of our brain. Um, that we have an implicit bias. Um, that everybody has implicit biases. It's, it's, it's impossible to you know, grow up in a world um, like ours without having them. So it's normal to have them. Um, it's the awareness, beginning to develop an awareness that you have them that can, uh, can help change that. But it's, it's an automatic response that we have. So there's not a lot of thought that's going into it, which is why it's a really quick, um, I'm assuming that the, that the t assessment was a really fast thing where you're doing it really quickly so that they're measuring more of your implicit bias rather than your conscious awareness. Uh, oops. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, one was like you talked about how like I, I'm trying to make sure I get this straight. You talked about how there's need to be like more people of color in science. I just want to know like why does that matter? Like I don't know. To me, like it shouldn't really matter. It's like as long as you produce non-biased research, that's the only thing that should matter. And then you also talked about how um, like the like tech like basically the second coming of the technology revolution. How robots are putting uh, people who are lower like poor people out of jobs. I don't really understand how that's also racist because shouldn't that just mean they should need to know how to do something else in order to like, like live? Like I don't, I don't really understand that. Tish, do you, I think the first question is directed towards you. Is that right? Sort of, but I feel like your situated knowledge okay. description, like, is really the reason, and like that's the the reason that Sophia Noble gives for for that. If you want to talk a little bit more about the situated knowledge. All right, I think that, yeah, in a perfect world, having a value-free science that uh, has no bias, yeah, that sounds wonderful, but that just doesn't exist. Uh, so if we have 
uh, lots of studies and research that are being published by white men, and white men are the ones who are earning tenure and getting grants to publish research and do studies and so on, um, then that's not necessarily unbiased research either. That's coming from a very specific uh, position of power as well. Uh, so having other people who have other perspectives uh, just enriches the field. In terms of uh, the question about replacing jobs, you know, yeah, exactly. Like if, if people had different educational opportunities to find more jobs, that would be a wonderful solution to the problem. But the fact of the matter is that not everybody has the same opportunity. So the jobs that are often easy to automate are jobs that are had by people of lower socioeconomic statuses who also happen to be not coincidentally racial and ethnic minorities. So when we're replacing those jobs, yeah, I follow your point. Wouldn't it be great if they could be trained to have some other jobs? Um, but, you know, training costs money. And if the if tuition goes up so much percentage every year, not everybody can afford the same sorts of opportunities. Uh, you know, I think, I think your question is great. If we lived in a world that didn't have bias built into how science is produced, and if we lived in a world where everybody had the same opportunities to achieve their life chances, that'd be a wonderful world. Let's, let's make that. Can, can I offer a thought about the implicit bias with like the photography example? Please do. So if you had a team of people inventing photography, working for Kodak, and those people all had different skin tones, the problem that you described, would we guess that problem would exist? Because probably someone who would, uh, would be a part of that group who may have a darker complexion may be like, hey, you know what? You can't see me in this. That's a problem. And so that's sort of a, probably a very simplistic kind of example of the need for diversity in science because then that situated knowledge has a range of perspectives, right, where those people could speak up given ideal circumstances and say, hey, for my life, this is a problem. When you have only mostly white dudes, then those, they may not even have intentions sometimes of having blind spots, but they do, right? And that Absolutely. comes through. Other questions? There's one in the back row. Uh, um, do you believe that um, re like bias in research over time will fade, or do you think it will be there till like it's forever? Tish? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I think, like, as humans, we, we have all kinds of biases, and I don't know that there is a simple solution to fixing that, right? And so it plays out in, in both the way information gets produced and the way information is accessible, and it plays out when we go and look for information. So when it comes to research studies that are done um, in institutions, so, like, the things that are, the people that are producing knowledge, right now there's an unequal an unequal system. So all kinds of research that gets produced that doesn't look at the lived experience of many people's lives. And so until we fix that, that's like, like the data. We just don't have good data. And then we're also, when we're looking for information, we're bringing all of our own biases and assumptions into it. And that's not necessarily always bad. It's just it definitely impacts the kind of information we're getting back. Um, so until we have a much better society and a more equal society, research is going to be, I think, at best problematic. One thing I'd like to add, forgive me, I was playing on my phone, I had to look up this quote. Uh, there's a quote from Martin Luther King, and it kind of applies here, I think. It says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So I think the more conversations we have along these lines, we get closer to that ideal. But I have to ask my math colleague, what's that chart that gets so close to the line, but it never, ever, ever, like, it's just closer and closer every time, but it never actually gets there. What's that called? That's called an asymptote. That thing. <laughs> so I, I uh, echo my colleagues here. I think that bias will always be present, but I hope, naively uh, or otherwise, that over time it will shrink towards zero. Even if it never actually approaches it, I think we can work and we can hope that it'll be diminished over time. And thank you for the question. Yeah, great question. And perhaps just to reframe a, a couple of the questions that have come up, I think that the uh, author, Asimov, uh, was, was somewhat of a positive you know, optimist um, to maybe think about the progress that we've made, whether it be uh, uh, bias in research or, you know, there was a previous question up front about 
well, why don't we just stop this technology and AI from being developed? What are some of the really positive developments of this uh, technology and um, automation and so forth? And, and has it um, empowered us in taking away some of our decision making? You know, I'm thinking of Netflix and other recommendations on Amazon that, that take away so many uh, decisions that I might have to make. Um, would, it, would any of you like to speak to that? There is an organization uh, called Orca, founded by Kathy O'Neill, mathematician. The book was on screen earlier. Uh, who started a company whose purpose is to evaluate algorithms used by other companies. Uh, ORCA stands for O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithm Auditing. And it's kind of like the organic stamp uh, for our companies. They measure uh, accuracy, bias, consistency, transparency, fairness, and timeliness. So it is an effort uh, to combat uh, WMDs, weapons of math destruction, as she, use, as she uses in her book. Uh, WMDs could be described as being widespread, mysterious, and destructive algorithms uh, in terms of their scale, their opacity, and their damage, and she's trying to counteract that by putting the cards on the table and giving companies tools to fix algorithms and evaluate them uh, if need be. Well, please join me in uh, thanking our panel members. We want to um, thank everyone for sharing their information, and thank you guys for coming today. I just wanted to remind...